more than 90% of global trade is moved by sea. We need to keep the world going. It's like, that's, that's our job. But with borders closed around the world, seafarers have been stranded on their ships for months on end. Victims of a poorly regulated industry, some are abandoned, unpaid and left to survive on their own. We still have an incredible amount of skullduggery going on, on the high seas. 101 East explores the unseen lives of seafarers during the COVID-19 pandemic. There's a tradition among seafarers that what happens at sea stays at sea. But 27-year-old Nadine Perido believes it's time to change that. She's one of a growing community of seafarers posting videos about their lives online. I just want to share what life we have on board because I feel like you know, seafarer life are very secretive and people are curious like what kind of work do you really do on board? My ship is a chemical tanker ship. As a navigation officer, I'm in charge of all the bridge equipments and navigation equipments. I'm here now already on board for four and a half months. Nadine's not exactly what you might imagine when you think of a seafarer. Hailing from the Philippines, the second officer is petite, the only woman on her ship, and she gets seasick. But she loves this job. For example, during long voyage that you can see only the horizon, nothing to see, no ships. A lot of people, it's very boring, but for me it's one of the best jobs. <laughs> Because of seafaring, I was able to see USA, I was able to see France, Italy. To be able to go to these places and see, it's like, wow, I'm so amazed, I'm very happy. There are 1.6 million seafarers on international merchant ships. And their time on shore helps them cope with their relentless schedule. They usually work 10 to 12 hour days, seven days a week for up to 11 months at a time. But when the pandemic hit, few of them were getting on or off their ships. I start feeling really isolated from the world because we cannot go ashore anymore. I mean, one of the enjoyments that we have is going ashore and we are just stuck on the ship. This was the beginning of a global crisis for the industry. Every month, roughly 50,000 seafarers are supposed to board vessels, swapping places with 50,000 others who disembark. With international borders closing, crew changes became almost impossible. For me, actually, I felt this anxiety of being unsure of when I can go home, when, when can I rest. Those who were due to go home at the beginning of the pandemic fared worst. Many celebrated two birthdays on board, missing the births of children and the deaths of parents. We are prisoners on the ship. And for me, you know, for me, it's only two months extension. And I cannot imagine what other people are going through. They are on board for 14 months, 16 months, 17 months. So, yeah, I felt isolated. While many international shipping firms behave responsibly, there are exceptions. Show me around the ship, Tan. I want to see where you've been living for the last 18 months. OK. Some have been under enormous financial pressure, and the seafarers on their ships are the unluckiest of all. The crew of the cruise ship Oriental Dragon have been abandoned in Malaysia by their employer. When the operation running, the here they have a restaurant, mini restaurant like that. 
Right now, nothing's here, so it's all, all empty. When the pandemic hit, passengers were stranded on cruise ships all over the world. We do have a swimming pool, but we cannot fill the water. As you see, uh, it's already dirty already. But after the holiday makers went home, many seafarers remained. Tamiat Tentan was a casino dealer on the ship. For Tan, who comes from Myanmar, working on the Oriental Dragon seemed like a dream job. When the cruisers stopped, the ship's owners in Hong Kong stopped paying them. It's been more than a year since any of the 200 seafarers marooned on board have received a salary. Okay, I'm with, uh, this is actually the main casino. The people spend most of the day hanging out here? Yeah, because we don't have anything, any other thing to do here. The ship's water, electricity and air conditioning are limited so they sleep on the floor of the dining room and casino. ตัวเอาเลยตัวไอ้สีรู้อาสาเว็บบุ๊คแค่ๆละเลยฟงบีดีเว็บบุ๊คแค่ๆละเลยบ่อันนั้นนี่ที่ละบ่เราไปจ้
you know, their finances, they control their life basically while they're employed by that company. It's a pretty antiquated feudal system. Some of those seafarers uh, are too scared to say anything about what might be happening on board a vessel because uh, fear of what might happen to them. We've had cases where the crew have said later on that that wasn't a suicide, that guy was pushed overboard. Really, for years, well, for centuries, the, the, it's been a, an un, one of the worst regulated industries in the world because of out of sight, out of mind. When Matt boards a ship, he asks for records of the crew's working hours and pay. He says there's sometimes one set of books used to show inspectors and a second, hidden one, that he has to ferret out. Some of the rubbish that's dealt to, given to us as evidence is just unbelievable. It's just made up in the office. What sort of documents, like forged bank statements? Yeah, yeah, for sure, definitely. Things greatly improved after the Maritime Labor Convention came into force in 2006. A Bill of Rights for seafarers, it sets minimum standards for their working conditions. But as inspectors like Matt have discovered, there are still plenty of rogue ship owners to keep them busy, especially during the pandemic. Last year, the ITF had a record amount of money recovered for crew style on wages. So don't worry, the, the cash register was still working when the pandemic was on. They were still working out how to, how to rob the crews. Hello. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Nice to meet you. Can you put the phone the other way so that it is horizontal? Oh. Yeah, is it okay with you right now? That's great. Few seafarers are as desperate as the 19 crew members of the Ulla, a bulk carrier docked in Kuwait. Many have been stuck on board for more than two years, and there's no end to their ordeal in sight. Banu Shankar Panda is the ship's third engineer. Show me where you are. This is uh, uh, the bird number 15. These are some banners we have put. Well, our hunger strike today is the 73rd day, and this is uh, a view. So this is the crew of the Ulla. Yes, sir. It was 25-year-old Akash Kumar's first voyage at sea. When, when did you join the ship? I was joined this ship on 7th Feb 2019. I was very excited when I got this job. At that time, it was good feeling that uh, dream coming true. This was Akash's first glimpse of the Ulla and his last moments of freedom. I joined this merchant navy because I, I love to explore the other places, other countries. And for money, of course, money matters. And this, this job gives more money than other land jobs. It started promisingly. But the ship's owner, a Qatari company called Aswan Trading and Contracting, soon left them in the lurch. Slowly, slowly, we were coming in trouble. Company were not sending us provision, water. We were in blackout for 19 days in the middle of the sea. They didn't send us provision, fuel oil, diesel oil, nothing. We were just surviving there. See, this is our barbecue for emergency because we are surviving. This is our sink for washing utensils. These are, this is our fuel. In February last year, the Ulla arrived in Kuwait and many of the crew were due to go home. But then the country went into lockdown. The news of COVID-19 came and everything stopped. If it wasn't for pandemic, we would have been at home. Later in the year, Aswan Trading and Contracting said it had no funds to support the ship and cut contact. The Ulla was arrested by Kuwaiti authorities. Ever since, the mostly Indian crew has been waiting to be paid, 
and for the ship's cargo to be removed so they can be repatriated. According to the information given to us, this cargo has already been sold and they are right now trying to discharge the cargo. God knows when. Uh, days turn to weeks, weeks turn to month, month turn to year. Sir, Kuwait Port Authority is uh, basically telling us uh, sweet stories with the honey added. Everybody is doing work on... Many of the crew have been forced to borrow money to support their families during the pandemic. Their biggest concern is how to deal with this debt if they're sent home empty-handed. Basically, I have taken personal loan. I promised the money lender that once in India I will return money. And these people don't have any idea to give us money. Just think about the situation. What? How will I be answerable to that money lender? The people that loaned you the money, have you told them, have you explained the situation that you're in? Yes, I already explained them, but they are not believing me. They are saying, you are uh, telling lie. This is never happened. In January 2021, close to breaking point, the crew started a hunger strike, hoping to draw attention to their plight. We are asking our salaries in terms of the sale of the ship and the cargo. Is somebody trying to understand this? We are justified. What is miserable, horrible condition we are going through? The chairman of Aswan Trading and Contracting, Nasa Hamad al Nuaimi, is wanted by Qatari authorities and his company has been blacklisted. But 101 East has obtained evidence that suggests a different company, Aswan Shipping Denizjalik, managed the Ula, although it denies this. This company also manages two ships detained in Australia for safety and labour violations which have now been banned from the country for several years. Abandoning seafarers has been described as the cancer of the shipping industry, and cases are at a record high, exacerbated by the pandemic. Altogether, the crew of the Ulla is owed more than 410,000 US dollars. We have been treated worse than animals. Say like dogs we are here. We have been thrown a piece of bread, eat and move in the ship. We are beggars now. This is a, like a nightmare, bad nightmare. This is a, like a hell. We are living. The pandemic has brought to light many heartbreaking stories, like those of the crew on the Ulla. Some hope this growing recognition will lead to more protection for seafarers. the port of Portland, security area. This is berth number one, and the ship there is uh, loading canola. Neville Manson's spent 17 years at the Mission to Seafarers in Portland, Australia. All right, come this way, this is where we are in here. This is the centre and this is the heart of what we do. We have like a shop for seafarers to come into, recreation area over there for the guys to watch TV. Well, these guys are away from their family and live and work on a ship 24-7. Uh, That's why seafair centres are so important. It's, it's a way of being able to get off that environment. So how did things change here when the pandemic hit? It put a stop to the seafarers coming off the vessel and visiting the centre. You must have been worried about them. Yeah, for sure. Um, worried about their mental health. What's going on here? Uh, this is the volunteers making up the welfare packs for the seafarers. We put together about 1,500 care packs already, and each one of them has got one of the, the beanies that's been knitted by someone in the community. Every pack's had a beanie in it. Well, that's very cold when you've come from the Philippines and you come to Portland, so these are highly sought after. Um, and yeah, they love them. During the pandemic, more than 800 maritime organisations, including shipping companies, signed the Neptune Declaration. 
It calls for seafarers to be recognised as key workers who should be prioritised in the vaccine rollout and for crew changes to be facilitated. If all of a sudden the world said, because of COVID, we can't have seafarers coming and going, the, the whole country would come to a halt. So they are essential workers in that respect. They're forgotten about. They see the ships come and go, the products come and go, but they don't see the human side of it. Hey guys, how are you? We're from Siemens Club. Well, obvious reasons I cannot come on board. Yeah. Okay, you're not allowed to come on board. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, Siemens no Club has been closed for over 12 months now. Oh. Yeah, a long time. It's yeah. really sad, eh? Yeah, yeah. So we've got some gifts for you, so we've got some welfare packs for you. Okay. All right, I'm going to grab them for you. There's one for every crew, okay? Yeah. I'll grab okay. them for you. Even these small acts of kindness resonate for seafarers arriving on foreign shores. Proof they've not been forgotten. No, if there's anything you need, you just let us know and we'll try and get it for you. Yeah, okay, thank okay, you very see much. when you can't leave the ship, yeah. we'll do the shopping for you. Yeah, okay. Yep. Thank you very much, right. sir. Welcome. No worries. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Just to see the faces, you know, that you've helped and that they're, you've just done a little thing for that particular day or that moment and they are so appreciative of it, yeah. I think that's what motivates me still. There's been a big shift in the mood on board the Oriental Dragon in Malaysia. Some of the crew have been stuck on this cruise ship for more than 18 months, but finally they're heading home. There's trepidation for Burmese seafarers like Tan because of the violent crackdown back home following a military coup. This is Oriental Dragon, tomorrow sign up crew. They're failing a farm to do COVID tests. The day before his departure, Tan gets a COVID-19 test and four months' salary, thanks to the ship's indemnity insurance. He's still owed eight months' wages, which he hopes to receive after the sale of the ship. But at least he won't be going home empty-handed. <laughs> okay, take care. Okay, take care. Good luck. The lives of these seafarers have been put on hold since they boarded. Now they can't wait to get off this ship and put the last year behind them. <laughs> Take luggage, go there. Take luggage, go there. So how does it feel to be finally off the ship after all this time? After one year and seven months, first time on the land is a pretty exciting, you know. For me, I don't want to go to the land. I don't want to go to the land. I don't want to go to the land. After more than a year at sea, the first craving to be satisfied is fast food. But Tan knows there's nothing like the taste of home. Mm. In Kuwait, the cargo of the Ulla was eventually discharged and the crew were finally repatriated, but they still haven't been paid. So far, 58 countries have recognised seafarers as key workers. Australia, 
Malaysia and Kuwait are not among them. They might keep the world going, but the welfare of seafarers is a distant priority for too many governments. ตัวเองเปลี่ยนด้วยจริงอ่ะมีอายุ <laughs> 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 